Dunkleosteus is among the most well-known of prehistoric fish and prehistoric life in general, and are the prime representatives for the class of fish known as Placoderms, and of the clays, Arthrodira, of which they are the largest known member. This diverse group of animals range from Dunkleosteus, of course, representing giant apex predators, but also detritus nibbling bottom dwellers, which range in size a good amount. The size of Dunkleosteus, though, and their proportions have however been consistently unclear due to their heads and thoracic armor being the only elements of their body which are regularly preserved in the fossil record, and, to fill in the gaps, utilizing the remains of other, more complete placoderms has been essential in trying to build a more complete picture of them and how they appeared. Certain certainty of their size largely stems from their comparatively unusual anatomy compared to most other vertebrates, which, in contrast to most other vertebrates, which either have skeletons that are either almost entirely cartilaginous or almost entirely ossified, arthrodeus like Dunk over here combine both an ossified head and thoracic armor with a mostly cartilaginous post-thoracic skeleton, which includes both the caudal region and major fins. Thus, while we do have complete remains of other placoderms that show the rest of the skeleton, the best known of these being the smaller Cocosteus and Amazichthys, in some cases with fins even in Dunkleosteus, the rest of their bodies are typically lost very early on in the fossilization process, and they're not extensive enough in the case of Dunkleosteus specifically to make accurate inferences about their overall shape. Body size and proportions influences almost all aspects of an animal's biology and lifestyle, from their life history patterns to the relationships between their prey and other predators, and Dunkleosteus would have been no different, hence why it's important to get to the bottom of what these fish would have looked like. Previous estimations of their full size has typically been done based on the dimensions of much smaller and also more distantly related animals like Cocosteus, though their differences both in body proportions, which is down both to their overall size, as about 35cm in length for Cocosteus, and their ecology, these animals being mostly demersal, living near the bottom of water bodies compared to a more pelagic lifestyle for Dunkleosteus. The largest arthrodea for which complete body fossils are known, Amazichthys, is just under a metre in length, which is still significantly smaller in size than even the most conservative ones estimated for Dunkleosteus, which would also further increase the risk of extrapolation error, which has been known to have in the past caused many inaccurate size estimates in other extinct animal groups. Recent attempts to measure their size by extending a proxy reliably used before to predict size in large sharks through an upper jaw parameter to arthrodeas has been done before, though the study that will mainly be talked about in this video found that these estimates, at least for this one, were not reliable from what they found, as it apparently failed to control for the anatomical differences between arthrodeas and elasmobranchs, mainly in the fact that arthrodeas have much larger mouths relative to their body size, more of which will be elaborated on soon. Lengths of 5 to 10 meters are commonly cited, though many of these methods are not necessarily based on rigorous statistical analysis, and so, to remedy this, a new way to better estimate their size was required. Formulated by Russell Engelman, the author of the study, it was clear that the new methods needed to 1. accurately estimate the length across fishes in general, be measurable in arthrodea fossils, as well as providing accurate lengths for the lesser group already known of from complete remains. Defined as orbit opercular length, or OOL, it was defined as the length from the anterior margin of the orbits, or eye region, to the posterior margin of the head, with there being several reasons biologically to assume that OOL and total length would be highly correlated in fish. For one, OOL encompasses two key anatomical regions, them being the neurocranium and the gill chamber, regions that are incredibly important for survival in most fish, and as such, their size is likely to be strongly constrained by evolutionary factors. The amassing of 3,169 observations and 972 species found that OOL is strongly correlated with the total length in fish, and also accurately predicted the body size on arthrodeas known from complete remains. Said outliers, as would be expected given the extreme diversity of body shapes seen in modern fish, were generally pretty different in terms of their proportions, the two main ones being the oarfish and chimeroids. Oarfish have long been used and seen as highly unusual and extreme in terms of their appearance to other fish, though still notable in how they are, more or less, the only examined taxon to differ to such an extent. Other anguilliform or eel-like fish, on the other hand, all showed a tight correlation between their heads and body proportions, which would not be expected unless there was some underlying physical and or developmental constraints keeping said factors consistent in fish. And, if this wasn't the case, it would be expected that many fish would be seen to show proportions like these animals. Chimera are interesting as they both support and don't support the relationship established in the paper, since on one end, OOL substantially underestimates their total length, and on the other, their body shape often shows that they mostly conform to the observation that heads and body proportions usually mirror each other quite consistently. Chimera are interesting in that while having a short head and a relatively short body length, 
It's the Rolongues, whip-like tails which leads to much of the discrepancy in estimated length. If there has a more typical fusiform body plan with a shorter and more false heterocircle or homocircle tail, then the OOL model would likely predict their body length with greater accuracy. From this, when Dacleosteus was plotted based on the anatomy we have from them, it came up with much smaller resulting sizes than would have previously been expected, with adults coming out at around 3.3 to 3.5 meters, a far cry for merely 5 to 9 meter reconstructions. At estimated weights of 950 to 1200 kilograms, heavily influenced by the very deep and cylindrical body plan, they were still large animals, especially for their length, given that a typical shark has to be around 5.2 meters in length to get close, though the drastic shrinkage is quite the interesting one. The length estimates were assisted by the knowledge that the pelvic fins, in all other complete arthrodeas, are located immediately posterior to the end of their ventral armour, and that their pelvic girdle is located approximately midway between the pectoral fin and the base of their caudal fin, even amongst those with more typical body shapes. Dunkleosteus having a short ventral shield, even compared to other arthrodeas, seems to suggest that a more elongate shape like their smaller relative, Amazicthus, is unlikely, and, in other aspects of the latter animal, supports more of a short and deep body plan for Dunkleosteus instead. The paper hasn't been without its criticisms though, and some elements of the paper and its methodology have been questioned. For one, the main figure going around is based on a reconstruction from an older paper but horizontally compressed, and comes off as disarticulated and with an almost hunchbacked look, something adjusted by other paleoartists in their reconstructions. In terms of other reconstructions, the Eugeniodont, Edestus, which features in the paper as a comparison animal, has the eye placed in the wrong hole in the skull, a mistake sometimes made, though given this is a scientific paper, it's pretty strange to miss. The ecological comparisons of the paper also seem to get a little muddled in terms of what constitutes as being pelagic for the sake of comparison between other fish groups, with fish like mackerel being classed as not being pelagic due to having a thinner body shape than their tuna relatives. It also shows examples of fish families that appear to get shorter and fatter as they become pelagic as a general trend, though given how sailfish buck this trend pretty heavily in being elongate animals that also get to large sizes and engaging in corinthiform swimming, being just as pelagically adapted as the other animals shown in the paper, but in different ways. Bringing up more implausible estimates and not so apt comparisons to make the alternative data seem less plausible has also been brought up by some, and even a certain degree of shaping the data to fit the results being brought up. One example of this is in the case of bringing up electric eels in terms of the position of their anal fins, a more extreme example where their organ placement is heavily influenced by their ability and capability to produce electricity, something used as the main example of fish with an anus further up their body than usual, even though electric eels are among the most exaggerated examples of this occurring. While there are points brought up to support this, to see what conclusions and observations they come up with, which would help in creating a more stable and corroborated result. In all likelihood, it is almost a certainty that there is absolutely more to look into regarding the paper and its methods, and other areas of where to look and what to test for have also been brought up. Assessing more fish families and taxa is a good place to, to continue on from this study, perhaps going over what was missed, as well as refining the OOL metric, which seems to somewhat arbitrarily use non-homologous points, e.g. the opercular bone in ray-finned fish versus the last gill opening in sharks, which can both be pretty variable. Differences in postcrania in animals like Martilicthus and Asthenicormus, animals that have very similar anatomy in their skulls, are very different in terms of their postcrania and adaptations that follow, even though both are 2 meter long suspension feeders. The relative width, length and depth of fish skulls alongside the neural cranial space and opercula varies considerably, as does relative body length, eye position and size, and assessing more landmarks and ecology would go a long way to further clarifying the points presented. Being done by a single author who did not have a previous background in ichthyology, yet alone paleoichthyology, while not immediately detracting of the talked about study or him personally, does mean that said study and the methods and results within should absolutely be open to further scrutiny and testing, and is surely not the last time we'll hear on this, as more people take a crack at estimating their length for themselves. Now, if a complete Dunkleosis fossil turns up, this whole practice will thankfully become obsolete. But in the meantime, paleontologists and paleoenthusiasts are sure to keep diving in on figuring out how these awesome animals look and live. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be. But it's becoming increasingly obvious. I can deny it no longer! I am small.